we've got about um, 10 minutes for a conversation related to what you just shared with us, which was amazing. Um, quite incredible. Uh, anyone have any uh, questions or comments? Hi, it's Umberto. Thank you, uh, Stephen and, uh, and Craig, for that amazing presentation. And, uh, and uh, Stephen, actually, to both of you, I, I think I would add to those challenges the um, uh, resistance and backlash from uh, men's rights activists. And I wonder if you can share some, some thoughts on that as well. Well, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's part of our world. Our men who feel victimized by this and feel challenged by their, in their power. And, and in some respects, um, uh, would like to fight back and see, and that so, so particularly in the child custody arena is where a lot of the energy is, court, court battles and so on. That's where, in fact, my, the interest at Jane Doe Inc., the state coalition was born of those challenges. That tells you so it's always part of it. And that the, um, the leadership here at the coalition was kind of fed up with only hearing from the men that hated their work and were wanting to, to end their work. And both in the courts and in the streets, both. And so they were, they mobilized themselves, the men that they knew who were supportive of the work. And that's where some of the beginnings were that were happening when I joined their, their process. And so all along the way, there's been a conversation about that. Uh, the protests at White Ribbon Day campaign, um, statewide events have been from them, uh, particularly to edit the, the pledge. This is what, the, to edit the pledge to, to say against violence against women, and they'll stand up and yell out, and children and men. And so that kind of sense of being excluded of, about something and not included in some conversation. And so we have found that the greater there has been a local voice of men who care and think about this and believe that there's a, there's a strong dimension of male offending that needs to be addressed and uh, um, changed and, and ended, is a, uh, is more that happens, the less strong the voice of the men's rights community seems to be in that locality. It's anecdotal, it's not real, but we feel that there's a, there's a helpful contribution the other piece we feel we do that's helpful for the, um, uh, particularly the women in the field who are doing direct services work, is to know which men are on their side and which men are not about this work. And so part of my role has been to help distinguish those things. And that the, um, you know, one of the similar, one of the main distinguishing features is I suggest they ask a question to the group they're talking to if they provide parenting education. And if they provide parenting education, they're unlikely to provide court advocacy. Those are the two dimensions. And the, the groups that are doing father's rights work are doing primarily if only court advocacy. And the, uh, and the folks that are doing responsible parenting or responsible fatherhood work probably aren't involved, if they are at all, with court advocacy. And if they are, they're feeling kind of mixed about the work. But they're primarily doing parent education and so on. So that's one of the distinguishing features. So it's always been there, and it's... Um, you know, uh, the model that we've grown is kind of an indirect confrontation of it, but it's there and continues to be there. Um, interesting, particularly in the field of working with the father's um, education, uh, responsible father's education work and movement, is how it interfaces with the court custody piece. Because the, it's an interesting part. Because you, you know, I don't maybe others of you who have been doing this work some will find that the facilitator in the group who have who have a, a guy coming up tomorrow in court, and he's asked to go to court to be there on his behalf, how does that work? So it's a, it's a, uh, in, you know, it's, it's, part of the, it's part of the dynamic that happens here. So it's in there, it's part of what we do, is have the conversation, have yeah. conversations sometimes with them even. Any yeah, other thoughts on the men's rights or answers to uh, Umberto's question about the men's rights responses? I'll, I'll just say that um, the, the one place that we've had the most direct interaction with them was in, when, in relationship to the Men Overcoming Violence program, the batter intervention work. Um, what I'm more interested in is the, the subtler issues or the grayer areas of, you know, where we, at the last summit, where somebody is uh, on the side who's a strong advocate for 
men uh, of color and fathers issues raises concerns he feels like the 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 rights and needs of those men are not being adequately addressed within a context that w his his perception is um focuses on uh sort of the 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 vector of men's oppression of women and the the issue of how to address the rights of men um who are marginalized and oppressed in a variety of ways and not be seen as a men's rights, you know, enemy, but as somebody who is a potential ally to, and, and, and how do we find common ground there? Um, I'm, I'm noticing that Craig, you put a, a chat question about efforts to connect together the various projects in Africa. And it's an interesting thing because when Men's Resources International started, our mission included building a global network. Men's Resources International started in 2004, the same year that Men Engage started. And so what we, when we saw that Men Engage was actually stepping up to this build a global network thing with a lot more capacity and, and, uh, and you know, ability to implement that, we backed off. But as you remember, when we did the training in Nigeria, we had men from Zambia who had just been in the previous training and Fidel from Rwanda attend that training because our, and then when we did the training in Rwanda, we brought men from Zambia and Nigeria because what we were looking to do was to build that um, regional network. And we were on that trajectory and then kind of backed off of that because we saw it being addressed in other ways. So, Stephen, when you do you, you know, you were talking about when you first went international, you wanted to see if your models that were developed in Massachusetts and the U.S. was adaptable. What was your experience and your first kind of um, response when you went into went internationally uh, and found the similarities, found that it was adaptable? Mostly, I'm thinking about similarities about male cultural norms throughout the world. Did you did that surprise you? Did you see those similarities? Did it surprise you? Uh, you know, I, I I was operating with a basic assumption that that um, there's some cross cutting things that are gonna be the same. That was my, but I also recognized that I was coming from a privileged white North American context and it's easy to assume everybody's like you because that's what we do all the time. And, and so, you know, it was really a check to go, how does, how does this work? And it wasn't only the, you know, the realities of male socialization that we were checking, we were also checking our methodology. Does the methodology that we use in the training work in other contexts? Because again, you know, the educational methodologies that we use are often very culturally bound and often pretty, uh, you know, from, from white culture, pretty, um, you know, dominating in many different forms. And so it was very confirming to see that the methodology that we're using, which in fact was developed um, on the basis of the work of people like Paulo Freire that talks about what does it mean to develop literacy at the community level for social awareness and social change, that that, you know, that theory really worked quite well in terms of here's what, what works at, at, you know, across many different cultural contexts. And it, in fact, it, it, the methodology itself spoke to the process of liberation and empowerment. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. So how are other, um, other thoughts that people are having, uh, both either related to uh, Craig and Stephen's presentation, related to the work, related to transitions and making those transitions, and how do you do them well? I really like what you're mentioning, Stephen, about methodology. Uh, how do we replicate practices in multiple cultures? And uh, so others, others have any comments or um, questions? Dig a little deeper. Yes, Chuck. The one question I have for, for both Steve and, and Craig is about supporting the new generation of, of men and, and boys and how to do that mentorship, what, what kind of strategies do you, do you think are, are um, possible to continue encouraging new generation of men and boys taking up on this work? And just to clarify, we'll start with uh, Stephen and Craig on this kind of a question, but also it'll be opened up to all of us as this uh, community of practice process here too. 
Yeah, I don't know the answer. I think, you know, Craig and I, we, we, we're hoping to sit down and have that conversation a, a little bit more. Um, I, I know that Merge is making a strong effort to get younger people involved in lots of different levels. And that's been really fun for me to, to have that um, opportunity. You know, and some of it might be uniquely in the moment. I am, I am now providing mentoring, coaching, and fundraising support for a 24-year-old man in, the, in Goma, the Democratic Republic of Congo, to create an a, a community-based organization that serves vulnerable children. And that he was somebody I met when I was there in November and just spoke to me. And, you know, and I felt like, wow, he, he reminds me of me. And, and I can help him. I, you know, and so just purely by text messaging and some email exchanges and a, a GoFundMe campaign that I have created, he's now running programs for these children and, it, you know, is, a, is, is engaging other young people to um, be volunteers in this initiative. And so it's, you know, that was idiosyncratic. It was finding, it was seeing a moment of time where they, I felt like, wow, I could really make a, be, you know, be really helpful here. This guy is way out there on his own with very little resources around him. And so that was a, that was a sweet opportunity and it's still unfolding. As well as a good question. And I, I think the idea of mentorship is really strong in other communities, you know, particularly uh, there's, a, there's a really strong mentorship vibe in the African-American community around me here in the Boston area about that. It's, that's a, that's a strong purpose um, about mentoring youth, move them forward, grow them. So tapping those real existing places, uh, working with leadership there to think about the idea of gender and, and the leadership of um, what healthy masculinity is. This is where I feel like it can be, it can be kind of, how do you amplify the vo this, this, this work by going to places where the work's going on and, can, and work with them on the content? Uh, there's, Every one of the members of, of our coalition, you know, uh, I know the slide I put up said 60, but it's, you know, some emergers have happened. I think the real number right now is more like 56 because of the merge. I don't know, Emiliano, if you have any mergers in Texas between these programs, but the numbers seem to change on a regular basis around here. But that every one of them is already in the schools. They, the first thing that, that agencies think about for prevention work is to teach, is to work with youth. And so all of them have got engagements with local schools and working with uh, middle school and high school groups and one of the models that's popular are teams of, of uh, you train up a group of teams to go teach their peers to, to talk with their peers with so peer leadership processes and having influence on the content there seems very meaningful to me um, that our coalition has this uh, has a this strong promotion of unhealthy masculinities and to ask the question what is it what is that and ask the kids, what is that? And have them think about it to be kind of a literate about that in relation to the media that they consume. And to be able to kind of think about that, that's, that's, where, the, that's where the work is going on now. And how do we make there to be a path from there to being part of the work going forward? That's not so clear. Going from there, like I have had plenty of interns who in high school went to a mentors and violence prevention program because in Massachusetts, for a while, MVP was in a, was in a bunch of high schools. Uh, then there was a hiatus because funding was dropped. They weren't in so many high schools anymore. And uh, some, endured, some of those programs endured the, the, um, the drought of funding. And some new funding's come along recently, and it's being re reintroduced, and a, a big group of high schools this coming year. Uh, but the, those high school boys get excited about it and carry it to their colleges sometimes. And then, then sometimes they find it find their way to me in a internship process. So just having a little internship running helps, you know. So that's one of the so institutionalizing pathways is kind of what I'm thinking about. What is what are some pathways that we can note as things that institutionalize such? And uh, that's one path I've seen. But not, no one's doing that exactly on purpose, but that's how it's, what's, that's what's going on. So I want to think about that. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Other comments, questions, sharing?
If you're talking, Emiliano, you're you're my, you're on mute. There we go. All right. Go. So I have a question for Stephen. I, you know, I, I just want to thank both of you and Craig for sharing your, your journey with us. I think there's, um, in the process, um, I've been very fortunate to, to, to walk alongside both of you and, and learn a great deal from you. So I just want to just thank you for, uh, for all the guidance and, and mentorship you both have given to me. Um, you know, I'm curious to hear from both of you in terms of your identities as these, um, you know, these cis white men who are doing the work and, you know, in a state um, like Massachusetts, um, you know, you talked about some of the diversity in terms of communities of color, uh, especially men of color. How do you, and, and also women of color and, and women's organizations, how, how have you held yourself accountable to those individual groups and, and um, you know, are sort of the lasting impressions that, that you have or any sort of advice that you have for folks who are really trying to make sure to center those people? I think you both did a great job of centering women um, in your work. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious in terms of how you have, how you see yourself being held accountable um, in, in your work and, and if are there any lessons there that we can that we can take and apply to our own work um, around the country and around the world as well hmm. excellent question Thanks, Stephen. you know well, it's a real challenge you know here's what I'm thinking um, may or may not be a direct answer that that uh, my work has evolved. The work at the Men's Resource Center was primarily in, in the context of men's groups, whether those were men who batter or men who are survivors of childhood abuse or young men or they, they, the framework and the, you know, the paradigm was let's get men together so that we can have this conversation and raise our consciousness and support each other and you know, engage in the world. And that has a tremendous value and, and a very important place. And yet when we started with, so the accountability in that, fr in that time frame looked one way and it was having women on our board it, um, and doing partnership activities with the local women's center to the extent that they were interested. You know, the, the message from one of the organizations was, you know what, we've got our hands full. We really, you know, accountability right now would be you go and do your own work and, you know, don't, don't, don't try to get something from us. Um, and, and when we started Men's Resources International, the frame was different, that the frame wasn't men's groups. The frame was women and men together talking about this issue of masculinity and how we um, have a shared investment, it, how it impacts all of us in the same ways and in different ways. And we have a shared investment and a shared responsibility to do something about it. And that's a different kind of process and a different kind of, so accountability looks different in that framework. For me, I, I was thinking it, when I first listened to your question, Emiliano, I, I thought of it personally. Um, as an individual in the work. There's an organizational dimension, of course, um, that, we, that we are also operating on um, when we think of, of this. But for me, it's like I understand that my view of the world is narrow, that I have just my perspective. But learning to own my perspective has helped a lot. That it's not that I, I can tell my story. And I know that my story is not your story. And, but there's an intersection, and I want to hear your story, that I'm genuinely interested, and I want to know what the values are in your story and what's going on, and that I'm, I feel honored to be in, in an environment where, you know, it's not my story, that's the majority story, it's a different story, and that that's how I hold it, and that I hold my accountability to hearing those stories, and to, it's, a, again, another piece of shutting up and listening to the, to the degree that I can, and that it's a... To know that the work I'm rolling out, helping roll out, is going to be um, is a a framework and not doesn't have a lot of content. It's got to be it's got to be made it's got to be brought alive by the people holding it. And so that's what is to me the piece. And the hard parts come where, you know, I make presumptions 
um, assume some things. Like language can come across really differently. Like take the word gender. And uh, gender is code for, for uh, different things for different communities. You know, like gender-based violence or gender might mean to a cis straight guy means gay. Um, uh, and it might be that that's pretty frightening. You know, we're not ready to really talk about that in a embrace, an embracing way. The idea of homophobia is a very different place in different cultures, it seems. Different place, you know, very, you know, like, I like to think, I don't know if this holds true across the board, that it's easier for us white guys to talk about it since we have whiteness to fall back on. You know, and, you know, it's, if, you have a, if you have a power to fall back on, it's easier to, to kind of question the oppressions um, that are there. I think those are, that feel seems to be real in some cases. And I just get excited when it surfaces in, the, in communities that are not my own. I just get very excited about that. And, and just, you know, I'm a, I, and so particularly in, the, in Massachusetts and, and the Boston area, the fatherhood work is held by African-American men most strongly. That's just doing the work. And talking about violence against women isn't always the topic they want to talk about. They're willing to say some things and willing to say that they're responsible for that, but that may not be the first topic on, on the table. It's the second or third topic. And something else is the first topic. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of experience I've had. Uh, not unlike you know, learning about kind of the Native American community in Massachusetts and what they're willing to hold about this. Just so many rich differences there, you know, and it's sometimes I feel so I almost jealous that there's a story that the people there tell that that surface is kind of an honoring of a mother that isn't in my story in, in anywhere near the same way. It's just really awesome, <laughs> you know, when it can be <laughs> surfaced as well as it is surfaced there. Um, so that's that's sort of where I take it. Is it's I'm humbled by the by the challenge. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Emiliano. That's the the question that continues to need needs to be asked continually, right? is how we have these partnerships and we all experience different levels of oppression and different levels of privilege and how do we, how do we um, speak to that and do it well. I mean, I, I think sometimes about even our nomin uh, calls, steering committee calls, and what's the process and what's the method and how white is it, right? And how open then is it to diversity and how straight is it? And so all those questions in the process. So what, uh, tell me, so when you had to do, both of you talked about these transitions, right? You made serious transitions throughout your career. So what was that like? Just making the transition, was it scary? Was it confident? Was it uh, confusing? Was it a great learning experience? Because a lot of us in the work are thinking about transition or making transitions. And, um, is there anything specific about making these transitions that's uh, notable for you and your experiences? Hmm. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Gen I, I generalize. Say, go ahead, Jack. I was going to say it's it's hard to generalize, but it's it's a it's a deep, deep question. And in my past transitions, so the time came, the time was right, and there were, or the time was, it's just a, it's time, it was time to do what was happening. And, um, and this sort of uh, uh, kind of trusting that, that the, you know, I'm, it will work out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's sort of how it happened. You know, there, was, there wasn't a lot of, um, Planning involved when I when I you know left Raven in St. Louis, you know, but I was following somebody to do something new in life, and it was time to make that transition. Um, and you know, and then there was a a fairly personal choice, and then to grow back, you know, to take step back from the direct service work and and direct program work and get involved in kind of a advisory capacity for a number of years, 
and um, and then uh, decide to go back to it. That was very deliberate. I remember that. So it's, it's, I guess it has to do with making choices. You know, you, you sort of have to put one foot in front of the other and trust oneself. Yeah, I would you know, say, I'll go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. I would say very similar to what you said, Craig. That mm -hmm. For me, this has been a spiritual journey um, as well as a social and political and personal, you know, le lots of levels. And the spiritual part of it is really listening to the, the calling. And uh, that has that has guided me each step of the way. And sometimes I've been more graceful than others at my, you know, how I've navigated that. But it, there, there has been a sense of um, a calling that uh, is saying it's time for something new. And it has often required tremendous patience because sometimes uh, the process of transition doesn't move as quickly as, you might want it to. One of the things that you both brought up in Emiliano, you just brought up too, is this idea of accountability. How has accountability in your transition processes, how important has accountability been or how has accountability directed you in, in making these changes from communities to communities and working with communities and commun different kinds of communities and same uh, communities from which you're from or identify being from? So that could be gender, that could be race, ethnicity, geographic, I mean, across the spectrum. And how has, has accountability been a piece of that that's helped you direct you in, in these transitional processes? Well, it was certainly central to my moving from the Men's Resource Center to Men's Resources International, that um, I felt that the structure, you know, the that there was this institution that was doing marvelous work and, you know, f amazing thing. And it was white, um, basically, you know, it, it had its, its efforts at diversity, but I had been working at trying to create more of a diverse organization. And I kept banging my head against what didn't, I couldn't figure out how to do. And at a certain point it felt like I need to, you know, the way to do this, is you got to start, <laughs> start over. You got to start from scratch, and wow. and so that you know that was part of the drive to go. Okay, Men's Resources International, based in Springfield, Massachusetts, working in communities of color. That's you know with a, with a a partner, a colleague who is a man of color, and um, and having a board that reflects a you know a broader uh, gender and racial diversity. So that was it. Maybe that was cheating, um, <laughs> but that was where how it you know how I moved with that. Great, Craig. Any anything to add? Mine is, is about uh, celebrating community, and that this is uh, not assuming that the I'm thinking particularly about the campaign that I operate the White Ribbon Day campaign in Massachusetts. That how it's experienced locally is is. Um, up to the locality and that you know the cultural groups i'm going to call them groups that have a strong personal identity find need to find their own way to hold it if it's going to be held mm -hmm. you know and that whether it's a language uh you know the and the the, the stronger differences are between the portuguese speaking community in massachusetts and a latino community an african-american community an american and a native american community and then um, kind of a kind of a white middle class community, and mm -hmm. kind of, and so they're they're just a respect that a respect that it's not there's no one way, but there is universal truth to the idea of safety and respect. That this is something we can want and need and have, and that that's universal. Great, thank you. So we've got about two minutes left in our community of practice event here and want to open it up for any kind of last thoughts or, or questions here for everyone. The question I have is where do we go from here with the community of practice? This was a great like piloting it and we did it internally to the steering committee. And it's, uh, for me, I love having a chance to have this kind of conversation with you all and would welcome more opportunities to interact in ways that are not purely 
um, kind of organizational administration. Uh, but I'm, so I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole level of closeness and intimacy with this that is not present necessarily during the, you know, every other month, uh, every other month uh, steering committees. But I, I agree, Steve. I mean, this is um, just, just uh, what a great opportunity to hear uh, from colleagues in the field and um, make sh- reflecting on your learning and how that, you know, has impacted this, this whole movement. And um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think something like this is um, as a, as a, we juggle, juggle with other learning and uh, uh, sharing opportunities with the webinar group, with the, with the uh, program, program working group that, you know, this is um, such a valuable piece uh, to this broader conversation. Um, it's really much more intimate. Um, and this, like, this was an hour and a half. I feel like it was 20 minutes long. You know? mm-hmm. Well, maybe we, we, could, we get two more volunteers and do this again. Mm-hmm. Oh, we will. This will continue. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, Chuck, you did a uh, wonderful job of facilitating this, and um, I mean, you have so much personal experience with all of this as well. But um, I just appreciated how you um, kept it moving and just flowed beautifully. So thank you for, for facilitating it. That really helps. Oh, thanks, Alan. Mm-hmm. So we'll figure out. We'll figure out a. Um, talk more about a process of the next COP and uh, figure out even a process and how to talk about it. But I think uh, perhaps some of the, what I'll do is send out an email. Uh, we'll do some logistics around the recording. I think it's very powerful. I think it's going to be very useful for many people to view this recording and participate in this. Uh, and I think we'll put out some ideas to the steering committee about uh, next kinds of focus and ideas of the next COP uh, focus and what people are thinking about. Again, with the idea of being able to share our work, share our experiences, and then also in ways that can be, uh, for some of these experiences, replicated in different communities and how that can best be done. Awesome. I I would like to echo everything that's been said and, and add my uh, gratitude to all of you as well. I think this was an, a really great start, and I wish – more people, I'm thinking Russ in particular, around the question of transition and how much he probably would have enjoyed to be part of this as well. So too bad he wasn't um, he wasn't able to attend. But uh, yeah, I, I I too enjoyed uh, sort of the, the personal um, connection and storytelling from both of you, Craig and Stephen. And and maybe uh, you know as as an next opportunity, we could have some of the younger generation. Uh, folks involved in this work talk about their experiences and, and maybe you know answer the other side of the question of uh, where to now and, and and how do we work on these issues across generations and, and all that I think that would be a very interesting conversation to have as well and uh, and, and to say that you know this this was refreshing because so many of these kinds of sessions end up being very technical in nature you know we're going to we discuss frameworks and models and all that, and that's very helpful too. And I think we should incorporate that into, uh, you know, uh, future sessions of, of our community of practice. But I certainly appreciate this um, a great deal. So thank you. Yeah, we're this we're we're trying we're trying COPs here at the at the coalition with our prevention workers around the state, primarily our RP grantees that, that correct mentioned earlier but we're doing we're doing a ser- like multiple COPs on different like I'm, I'm moderating the one on rural and border communities and, and we have one on uh, uh, community level work one on evaluation and one on our break the box curriculum so you know we're, we're trying I, I really like this in terms of, in terms of having the, the you know providing time for folks to lay out their work and Giving folks an opportunity to ask questions, I really, I really enjoyed that. It also makes a difference. We're, we're using Zoom and we're using video conferencing on our COPs, so I think that makes a really difference. People feel very connected, and it does feel very intimate. It feels like we're having a conversation in the same, same room together. So I really appreciated that. Yeah. 
I really like the format. I think you have to have a strong moderator, somebody who can move the conversation along, which I think Chuck did really well. And uh, I just, you know, it, it, I think it's it was it was a it, it was very appropriate for this to be our our first one. Um, I think with both of you and the transitions that you're making in your li your professional and personal lives, uh, it's really excited to, to stay connected to you and continue see you do the work because I, I think that's that's also um, you know this was I think to, I feel very fortunate that I could that I could be a part of this conversation and so uh, I'm excited about sharing it with folks and, and hearing um, hearing about what folks think about this um, in the field and uh, so I'm excited about the next one yeah yeah. I'm Any other? Looking at the sign in sheet, I think I know it was. I think it was maybe on. I'm hearing somebody talk about a sign in sheet. <laughs> so it's a muting thing. Oops. Um, yeah, just one last. For someone like myself who, who came into this arena after having left an entirely different um, profession, and um, it, it just really helps fill in some gaps, uh, Stephen and Craig, with some history. Craig, I've talked to you, got some bits and pieces, the old, you know, the, the Iowa Drake University, uh, you know, third uh, conference, Men and Masculinities Conference. Um, that's, that was a, a really fun connection to make with, with you being here in Iowa. And Craig, when I began thinking about or my career changing drastically from what I was doing was right when I think you were headed over to, on one of your slides, what, like the 2000. 2005 mm -hmm. really really broadening your um, uh, your service to um, the the, the uh, colleagues in Africa um, it's really it's really awesome to kind of have some of those um, history kind of filled in and so it, uh, thank you both for sharing your your stories today That's one thing I know too is that we do have individuals on the steering committee with substantial international work and uh, intra community, inter community work too. And again, looking at these methodologies and looking at the content and uh, you know what you're talking about, Craig, about who who determines the content and then and then uh, Stephen talking about the methodologies and are they are they suitable and that kind of stuff. So we have a lot of it's amazing how much. Um, really expertise and value we have and resources just on our steering committee alone we haven't even expanded yet into a membership and others I mean it's everywhere um, so it's really is a pleasure after these many years right and that we're still having these conversations uh, you know since the 70s and still working with women and still have some high ideals and high commitments to accountability um, to uh, many, many different folks from many different kinds of communities and identities. And so I think as we keep moving on with this commitment and keep moving on in these kinds of avenues of sharing and listening and sharing and listening and then replicating and action, um, we will see the vision that we want to see here ultimately as we continue to move this forward and move it from generation to generation and into individuals using their influence to change organizational practices, public policies to stop this stuff before it is even happening and change the social norms that support these kinds of injustices. So I appreciate you all's um, participation and, and commitment to this work. It's a, it is an honor to be with you all. That's for certain. Well, thanks, Chuck. Chuck. So how, yeah. do we, how do we end this? Do we just start waving and saying bye? <laughs> Winks. Uh, I think winking is good. Winking, winking. Yeah, winking. Yeah, and we'll we'll do some logistics around the recording and stuff. I'll talk right. to you, Craig. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Brilliant. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.